Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you very much. Um, I, I do need to, before I get going, uh, thank my friends at the Art World Communications Forum for inviting me back yet again. Um, I think this is the fourth or fifth time that I've spoken here. Uh, I always enjoy it. It's a wonderful group. The, the mission, uh, bringing together people from uh, both developed and emerging markets um, to, to further this profession. It's one that I really believe in, um, and it's always been really flattering uh, to be called back. And, and one of these days, I'm going to stop believing this PR guru stuff and just put it on my business card. Um, but but once again, you know, uh, all the all the, the sort of wisdom that you're going to hear in the next 20 minutes or so is um, entirely plagiarized from other people. Uh, I spend my time talking to a lot of people who do PR and uh, trying to distill their wisdom down into sort of 20 minute sound bites. That's really what you're going to get um, today. Uh, very little of this is original to me. Uh, but it is important. I do think that this topic of the battle for talent is the critical topic for our industry over the next two or three years. Uh, for reasons that were alluded to this morning uh, by uh, my friend Maxon, uh, who was talking about the way in which various disciplines are converging. Uh, there is no question in my mind that <coughs> advertising and digital and social and public relations are all colliding with one another in a way that is going to create massive change and massive chaos for everybody. And whoever comes out of the other end of that in a dominant position is going to lead communications and is going to lead what I would call public relations for the foreseeable future. And I believe two things. I believe, first of all, that most of us are not prepared yet for that collision and that convergence. And I believe that this topic of talent is absolutely critical to being prepared. As I said earlier, I spend a lot of time talking to the biggest PR agencies in the world. And I have come away from those discussions absolutely convinced that somewhere between a third and a half of the people working for those agencies are not fit for purpose as our industry moves forward over the next four or five years. I would be very, very surprised if those numbers were not the same at the agencies or the companies that you represent. We have right now in public relations the ideal workforce for the 1990s. That is a major problem because we're not living in anything that remotely resembles the 1990s. <laughs> there was a time relatively recently when the vast majority of people who worked in our profession had the same skill set and the same basic job, which was to pitch stories to the media. Some of them were writing press releases and sending them out to 5,000 newspapers across the country or across the world. Some of them were calling up the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Financial Times or the Straits Times and trying to pitch them on a specific issue or a specific story. But they all were essentially doing the same thing. If the majority of people who work for your firm today have that as their basic skill set, you're in big trouble because that is not where the future of our industry lies. It's not where the majority of your revenues in the future are going to come from. And it's not where you're going to be able to add the maximum value to your clients. We need to start thinking about an entirely new group of people with an entirely new group of skills and with the right mindset for our industry going forward. I'm working on an article right now that will list these in order, but I'm going to run through maybe half a dozen or so of what I think are the critical skill sets for our industry going forward. <coughs> first thing I should say is, on this first area, um, this is something that I heard here for the first time maybe four years ago. 
uh, when I shared a platform with a gentleman called Marshall Sponder. Uh, Marshall Sponder um, suggested that any firm that did not have a chief data and analytics officer was already losing the war for, um, for, for the future of our business. How many of the people in this room have somebody in their operation with a title similar to chief data officer uh, or chief analytics officer? Okay. <laughs> We've moved four years down the line and nobody is following this advice. <laughs> data and analytics are going to be absolutely critical to your firms. Not in the future, not, not, not five years from now, not <coughs> ten years from now, tomorrow. Today, yesterday, here's the deal. We're moving into an era where the people with the best data will come up with the best insight, the people with the best insight will come up with the best strategy, and the people with the best strategy will be the leaders. If you don't have the best data, the best insight, the best strategy, you are gonna be a follower. You are going to be subservient to somebody else who is smarter, and better informed and more analytical than you are. If we don't start bringing people with real data and analytics capabilities into this business in greater numbers than the three or four hands that just went up, then we're done, finished. The second thing we need, we need people who come out of a behavioral science background, who understand how opinions are formed and how minds are changed and how behaviors are redirected. We need to bring in more people who have a neuroscience and a behavioral science background, who understand cutting edge thinking in these disciplines, because the way in which behavior changes is totally different from the way in which we try to drive behavior change. How many of you, for example, know for a fact whether if you want to give up, when you want people to give up smoking, you make them frightened, hopeful, or amused. Which one of those tactics works best? Anybody know? Hopeful. Hopeful. Hopeful, hopeful is certainly more powerful than fearful. Uh, there's a lot of evidence emerging that humor is more powerful than either of them. That finding some way to make the message amusing and to build that into the messaging is more important. But the fact of the matter is that the thinking on this and the neuroscience behind this and the behavioral science behind this changes almost every day. And we need to be on top of it. We need to, and by the way, one of the fun things is, do you know how, do you, do you know what happens when you provide people who don't believe in global warming with more information about the facts of global warming? You're nodding, what happens? Yeah, they, they just create their counter reactions based they on They become more convinced of their original position. The more facts you provide them, the more ignorant they become. We have, as an industry, relied on facts. We've assumed that if you just tell people what the truth is and tell it to them repeatedly, they will eventually come around. That's not how the human mind works. If you have a, a belief that is based in your values, then you are going to reinforce that belief every time somebody challenges it. And we have to find new ways of persuading people. And the most powerful ways of persuading people, this is sort of good news to the PR industry, is storytelling. And so we need to come up with new kinds of storytellers. We need to bring people into this profession who really understand how storytelling works. Not just storytelling in a press release, not just storytelling in a pitch to a media, but storytelling in all kinds of visual and emotional ways. Emotional messages resonate much more powerfully than factual messages. We have to start incorporating that into our thinking. And we have to bring in people who really understand this. This is not a definitive list, right? But we need people who are good at data visualization, who can take all that data that I was talking about at the beginning and turn it into an image, because people, not me, I'm a words guy, but most people react to images much more strongly than they react to words. We need animators. The, the winning PR campaign at Cannes a couple of years ago uh, was the Chipotle grill, um, 
uh, animation, which was basically a cartoon story. It was a wonderful story, but it was told as a cartoon. How many of you have professional animators working in your agency or among a stable of freelancers that you use? That's great. That is slightly more encouraging. Um, Okay, another, another group of people who, we don't necessarily need to hire these people, but it'd be great to have them available to us. Another group of people that I'd like to see working more in our industry, stand-up comedians. Stand-up comedians really know how to tell a story. They know which words work and which words don't. They know how to craft a narrative. They know how to provoke a reaction. They know how to get a laugh. It's very important. We can learn from these people. We can learn from, from people in the theater. We can learn from, from improvisational groups. Improv is a wonderful <laughs> PR skill. The ability to stand up in front of an audience and on the fly come up with things. Uh, seriously, our CEOs should be trained in improv before they go out and give media interviews. <laughs> We need to bring in all of these kinds of people. There's, there's, there's going to be a definitive list at some point. Um, and then we need to, because I don't have much time, we need to make sure that they have five broad, um, I would say, sort of personal characteristics that we, that we don't as an industry value enough right now. Those five things. First, business acumen. I continue to hear. I, Never hear from clients, from CEOs in particular, our PR people don't understand the media. I occasionally hear they don't understand social media, they don't understand digital, but I never hear they don't understand the media. What I do hear is they don't understand the business. They are not sufficiently business savvy. You have to be as smart about business as the CFO, the chief legal officer, the chief human resources officer, any of those people, because you are going to be in a room with them and your CEO is going to be planning to do something stupid. Or your design department is going to be planning to do something stupid. They're going to be planning to put a little device on your cars that masks what the emissions um, are really like. They're going to be do doing something that you're going to want to stop. And the argument for stopping it is not going to be a public relations argument. It's going to be a business argument. And if you don't understand business at least as well as everybody else in the room, you're going to lose. So business skills. What are the other points? Everybody here has heard me say this before, if you've, heard, if you've been here at this event before. But there are, these are the four personal qualities that I believe that everybody working in our industry needs. The first one is courage. Courage is what helps you stand up in a room of people who want to do something colossally stupid and say, stop, you can't do that. And sometimes you have to put your job on the line. Sometimes you have to stake your reputation on it. You need the courage to tell your CEO that something, some corner that he desperately wants to cut, some decision that he wants to make to save money, is the wrong thing to do. You need courage to do that. You need curiosity. Public relations people have to be constantly learning about the world around them. The culture in which you operate, the pop culture, the sociological culture, all of those things. Somebody this morning asked me a question for a video blog that, that I was recording outside, which is basically what should PR people read. And my answer was the incredibly unhelpful everything. You have to read everything. You have to, and you have to watch everything. You have to know what your consumers and your employees and your shareholders and your communities know. You have to know which celebrities they care about, which politicians they listen to, which news media they care about. You have to know this and you have to be familiar with all of it. You have to be insatiably curious. You have to be learning all the time. You have to have integrity. Again, the core of this business is trust. The core of this business is credibility. We as an industry have allowed ourselves to be defined by the worst practices of our peers. We have allowed public relations to become synonymous with spin, with manipulation, with deceit, with obfuscation, with outright lying in some cases. 
The reality is we are working in an incredibly transparent world. The biggest thing that has changed over the last four or five years, it seems to me, is that if your public relations messaging is inauthentic, you will be discovered almost immediately and you will be punished as severely as possible. The world has changed in that way. You have to operate as if you're going to be found out. That means you have to operate at all times with integrity. The final quality that I believe we need to recruit for is empathy. I think empathy is the defining leadership skill of the next decade. I think that this ability to understand and sympathize with others is incredibly important, not just in our profession, but in leadership generally. Um, so I find it incredibly difficult to make this case in any kind of convincing way at a time when the most popular politician in my adopted country is Donald Trump. But I nevertheless believe it to be true. Leadership is about empathy. Leadership is about when your critics attack you not automatically attacking them right back, but trying to understand their point of view, trying to walk a mile in their shoes. And this is a quality that public relations people have to bring to their senior leadership. Because not many CEOs got to where they are today by being giants of empathy. It's also a reason why I suspect we are going to see more and more films sort of fitting that we're here on um, International Women, Women's Day to discuss this, more and more female leaders over the next decade than we have ever seen in the past. Because this kind of empathic communication, I think, still comes much more naturally to women than it does to men. I think men have had the empathy kicked out of them by the time they reach their late teens. They're not naturally as good at it. They haven't been taught that it's a valuable skill. And we're going to see more women leaders as a result of that. But these are the personal... <laughs> Why is it only women who have a hold on the mic? <laughs> when I say that. But these are also... I'm going to summarize very quickly because I'm about to jump onto a panel. Um, and the panel, I suspect, will be much livelier than this. We are in a war to win the best talent. All of the people that I've been talking about, the data and analytics people, the behavioral science people, the content creators, they did not grow up, they did not go to university thinking, when I get my, when I get my master's in neuroscience, when I become the world's greatest animator, when I understand data and their analytics and statistical correlations and regression analysis, that's going to make me a great PR person. They are not out there right now thinking, I'm so close to getting my dream job in public relations. We have to convince those people that this is the most exciting, stimulating, valuable, worthwhile profession from which, to, to which they can dedicate their talents. I really believe that's true. I've said this before almost every time I've spoken here. When public relations is done right, it is about bridging the gap between what society expects of its institutions and how those institutions actually behave. It is about bringing into alignment big business and big institutions that can shape the lives of everybody on this planet and what the planet really needs. If you can do that, and if you can find these talented people to help you, then public relations will not only win the war for talent, it will win the, role, the war for a strategic leadership position in corporations and other organizations, and finally, finally, achieve what it should have been doing all along. Thank you very much indeed.